Welcome to Your Journey. I'm your host, Chuck Lewis, and we got a special guest with us today, and Devon Fryson, a.k.a. D. Freeze. What's going on, man? Man, I can't call it, man. I appreciate you having me on, man, giving me a chance to tell my story. I appreciate it, man. I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? I'm doing good. I mean, obviously, we're in this pandemic, uh, trying to adjust to this new normal. Uh, it's been an adjustment for me. How has that adjustment been for you and your family? Yeah, it's been a little tough, man. Just, you know, getting out of routine, getting up, going to work every day, working out, coming home at a certain time, making dinner now. It's a little bit different. I think I'm getting into a little bit of a routine now just from working from home. Wasn't really good with the technology. Now, <laughs> now look at us. We on Zoom. I got another computer right here. So yeah. it's, going well. it's going well, man. Getting used to it. Well, I'm glad it's going well, man. It's been an adjustment for everybody. You know, obviously, I think just trying to work from home has been a challenge, but as time went on, you find a routine, and that's what it's all about, trying to find some consistency in a routine in this pandemic. But uh, let's get right into it, man. So you grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. What was it like growing up there as a kid? Yep, so I, so I grew up outside of Jacksonville, Florida, Middleburg, Florida. Uh, usually I say Jacksonville because a lot of people really don't know Middleburg, Florida. So that's probably about 15 minutes from, from the city. So for me, man, I grew up in the middle class. Uh, my mom and dad moved there. My mom was in the military. Uh, she had a... a recruiting job down there in Jacksonville. So that's really where I was raised. I don't have any really neat family down there. My dad's still down there. Uh, grew up in the middle class. Parents got divorced at a young age. Uh, so my dad raised me. Uh, and you know how it is with, with your dad, man. You got a brotherly love. You know, it's kind of, you know, tough enough to be a man. So, you know, I was in sports early at a young age. You know, I started playing soccer around five years old and football from seven to all the way to 23 years old. So sports was a big part of my life, man. Just one of those guys, man, that's lively. Uh, love, love being outside. Love being in the mix, man. So, Jacksonville, uh, uh, Newtonburg was was a uh, was a good time for me, man. Growing up, man, I can't complain. So, you were actually born in Japan. Talk about how your parents were able to transition back to the U.S. Yeah. So, my mom and dad they actually met in the Navy. I think about uh, eighty three or some somewhere around there. I wasn't even born yet. Then my mom, uh, she got stationed out in Okinawa, Japan. Mm. about 29 years old and then my dad he was getting a little bit of a trouble a little bit of trouble man was was a drinker back then um and got you know got out the navy and then he actually flew out uh to see my mom and actually just never came back she never came mm. back out there actually saved his life he, like sometimes he tells me your mom really saved my life got me back on track so i ended up uh being born out there don't know a lot about it uh don't remember it at all but that's on my birth certificate, man. Okinawa, Japan, September 8th, 1990. Yeah, no, that's good, man. I mean, I think that's something unique that most people can't say that they were born uh, in a place like Japan. So right. you, you attended Fleming High School. What was that experience like going there as a student and as an athlete? Yeah, so crazy thing about it is uh, one of one of our players on on our Maryland team right now that we both know, Glenda Miller, he went to Ridgeview High School. That was the high school I was supposed to go to before Fleming Island was built. So when I got to Fleming Island in 2006 as a freshman, it only been open one year before that. So I was there the second year. Uh, great school um, in the suburbs area, probably about 15 minutes from, from where I grew up. Uh, a school, uh, you know, best education, things like that. Um, you know, it, it is different going from junior high to high school. You know, right. maybe, you know, your elementary, maybe you go to junior high, it's a little bit library, and then you go to high school, and it's like, oh, man, I'm really out here now, man. Guys got cars and things like that. So, you know, I was a guy, I was on varsity my freshman year, so I was always big into sports. I, I knew the coaches before I even got there. They, they recruited me in junior high, so um, it was a good experience for me um, in, the ninth, in the ninth grade. And I know I, I actually moved out to California after that, but ended up coming back and finishing at Fleming Island, so it was, it was a good experience for me. Yeah, so uh, you talk about actually playing varsity in the ninth grade. Um, mm -hmm. So in your ninth grade season, you got a chance to play against Tim Tebow, Talk to me about that experience. Yeah, so me, so let's date, let's date it back before that, man. I, I'm, I'm an offensive guy. I want the ball in my hands, man. Like, 
I like scoring touchdowns. I like routing guys up. You know, I like I like breaking ankles, things like that. So when I got to uh, high school, and I was a smaller guy. I was probably 140, 145. And I think they just seen that I was so athletic. It's like, this guy needs to play corner. And our, our receivers were a little bit deeper. Um, we needed help on the defensive side. And at that time, I'm like, hey, if I'm on varsity, I get a letterman jacket. I'm, I'm fine with it. <laughs> you know, at that time, Tim Tebow was a senior. That's when the um, – the, uh, the show, the two days came out where they played Hoover High School. Um, I mean, I, I remember seeing this guy in junior high. I mean, every game that was there, man, with ESPN trucks. I mean, the guy was just a legend, good kid off the field. Uh, he was on the weightlifting team, basketball, baseball, you know, was just a model kid. And I was actually out there, blessed to be out there um, at corner when he was when he was at quarterback. And, I mean, first play of the game, he comes my way. And, I, hey, I ain't gonna say I was scared, but I was a little bit like, man, this guy's coming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I got, I gotta try to, I gotta try to shoot at his legs or something. But that was a great experience for me. Um, just seeing him at the University of Florida, seeing him in the league, and seeing him still to this day now. But you know, I was blessed enough to say I played with, I played against that guy, and he grew up thirty minutes from where I grew up from. So that's that's a, that's a blessing to have that. So you touched on it a little bit, but talk about. In your sophomore year, right before it started, uh, you actually moved to California to be with your mom. Talk about that transition and how that all came about. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was that was a tough transition. As I mentioned before, uh, my mom and dad divorced. You know, when I was when I was really really young, my mom's in the military, so I would see her uh, summer, Christmas, you know, things like that. Um, so in that tenth grade year, I'm uh, maybe 14, 15 years old. You know, you start you, you start getting yeah. So that transition um, to live with my mom in, in the in the tenth grade was a big transition. Um, mom and dad divorced at a young age. You know, my dad raised me, which is really abnormal. Usually, you go with with the mom, um, but I would see her Christmas and summer and things of that nature. Uh, but that, but during that time, you, you know, you really you don't know until you're really on a day to day with a person for you know right. at a time. So. The reason I went out there is, you know, my dad, me and my dad was up in here a little bit. Grades weren't where they were supposed to be. Yeah. Uh, getting a little in trouble in school, class clowning, detention, you know, things like that. You know, typical teenager things. And uh, at that point, I made a decision that, you know, maybe, maybe I should go, you know, live with my mom. Maybe I should, you know, try a new experience. And uh, well, we sat down and talked about it and, and he ended up sending me out there. And I went out there and it was, it was a tough transition just because we didn't really know each other at that point, um, as, as good as we thought we did. Um, but I was, ended up staying out there for a year, playing football, basketball, track, same exact thing I did in Florida. Um, was actually being way better out there. The competition was way better in Florida yeah. than where I was at. But ended up making it free and coming back to live with my dad and ended up putting out in the same high school I started. In. Yeah, so uh, you spent the year out there going from Florida and then going all the way to the West Coast. You talked a little bit about it, about playing sports. Uh, go a little bit deeper into that. Now, how was it playing football out there versus being back in Florida? You know, what position did you play out there? And what was, like, the whole experience like for you? Yeah, so in the ninth grade, when I talked about the when I was on varsity, I was playing corner, which is halfway through the season. Then I ended up going back to JV. Mm. Offense. Um, different style of offense. Florida was more spread, um, high speed, mm. you know, uh, slot route, sweeps, things like yeah. that. When I went out there, it was more of an eye for me. So I really played running back, played running back. It's like a, your typical Adrian Peterson downhill, A gap, B gap, you know, at, at 135. Yeah. But competition out there, you know, I was kind of in the desert of California. Usually when you think of California, you think of LA, you think of San Diego. I was down there like really by Mexico, yeah. you know. So it was not a lot of competition down there. It was way, way easier. Um, and then when I went to Varsity, I, I started off in JV the first eight games, and then the last four games I went to varsity. I mean, I think I had like 600 yards in four games and four touchdowns already. So um, they, they begged me to stay out there, but I was ready. I was a Florida guy. I was just ready to get home. Yeah. So you got back home after a year. How was it transitioning back home into your house with your dad and just transitioning back in school and catching up with old friends? Man, you know what, man? i tell you what. I went to school at the University of Akron, and I remember when LeBron came back to the stadium, man, it was like, it was like I was coming home, you know. Yeah. I, it was like I was coming home. I couldn't wait to get home. And I was, when I was there, but it, it was like I, I didn't lose a beat. I didn't lose a beat. I went right to the school. Uh, even girls that I used to talk to in junior high, ninth grade, you know, I heard you're coming back. You know, 
it kind of built up t- towards coming home. You know, people reaching out, you coming back? Or, yeah. Coach, man, you really coming back, man? What position you want to play? You know, what you want to do? You want to be this position, that position? You know, that type of thing. And then, um, honestly, it, it, it was a blessing for me. It was a blessing for me to go. I was mom. My mom was more uh, on me about education. So I learned a little bit more there about being accountable, about going, uh, do, doing my work right, and studying, building study habits. And then when I came back, you know, I, I took the same route. But it, it was a coming home party when I came home, man. I, I wish I could relive that right now. Yeah. Well, now that's always a good thing to come back home and, and receive the praise and the accolades right. and, and right. to feel that love from everybody. Right. Um, right. So obviously you gave them a return on that. Your junior season was like your breakout year. Um, you, you led your team to a district title. I think that was the first time maybe ever been done in your school history. Um, you received first team all county honors. Now in the state of Florida, to be able to do that as a junior is pretty big. What type of preparation did you go through in that off season to get ready to play at that level? Honestly, I didn't really, you know, listening to guys now and being in the, in the field now, like back then when I was, we had an off season, but it really wasn't like when you're done with football, guys went to basketball, guys went to baseball, track. It wasn't like now, like you see guys from the math high school, they train all year round. Uh, I would lift weights, I would run routes, but I wasn't doing nothing abnormal, like at home or, you know, doing things like that. Um, I started kind of getting like that when I got to college. Uh, so for me, honestly, it really was just a blessing. I was blessed with a with a with a talented quarterback. He ended up going to Arkansas State in Division One uh, the year before me, and I actually just fell into the right part of the puzzle to make it to make it flow. Uh, it was perfect for me. I got a little bit of receiver, a little bit of running back, kick return, punt return. Um, but when I came back, I wanted to come back with a bigger too. Uh, I was a little bit scared of, man, I'm playing against this competition. Yeah, they were, you did good, but they're not going to be as good. They're going to be way better when you go back to Florida. You're going to be able to hang. And I, I kind of had that on my on my shoulders a little bit. Mm-hmm. But when I came back, it was a little slow. First couple games, no touchdowns, not really, you know, no really big plays. And then I just kind of exploded, you know, towards the end and was able to be blessed to get a scholarship after my, after my junior year, which really you mm-hmm. didn't see back then. You didn't see you get a scholarship that early. Yeah. yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, a guy your size back in those times, it, w- it was hard to get recruited at the Division One le- level, let alone to be offered as a junior. Uh, so touch a little bit more on that. So you got offered by the University of Akron as a junior. You decide to commit to the University of Akron. What other schools were interested in you and then what made you commit to the University of Akron? Honestly, a lot of people don't know this about me. I had one offer. That's it. I had one offer, which is University of Akron. So I got my uh, offer after my junior season. So back then, in 2009, how my generation looked at it was in Florida, if you got a D1 scholarship, you get a man. Like, it doesn't matter if it was WAC, I mean, San Diego State. If you went D1, like, man, like, you can walk through the mall and they'll be like, man, that's a kid from an island. He's going D1. They might not know the school, but they know he's going D1. You know, so for me, when I seen that come through the facts, I remember I was in fifth period and, uh, uh, Miss Johnson, my English professor, said, hey, Coach Chip wants to see you. My head coach's name was Coach Chip 11. He called him Coach Chip. Mm. I'm like, oh, what's he want? And sometimes he would call me down there and you know, watch me or whatever. So I get down there. He he he, he looks at the facts. Facts come to he, he gives it to me. He said he want to offer you a full scholarship. And I kind of broke down right then and there like, wow, man. Mm. So for me, I looked at it. I didn't want to see the school. Right? I'm taking it right now because I'm 145 pounds, right? I don't know what type of season I'm going to have next year, right? It's a D1 scholarship. That's what you want. So I jumped on it. So I committed. I committed I committed right then and there. And uh, I think the biggest thing why I didn't get a lot of offers after that was because now I was known as, man, he's going to act. Right. A couple of people in Jacksonville that were like, man, he's going to Ball State. Like, it was like I would wear my Akron hat to school, you know what I mean, before I even got to the school. Like, everybody knew I was going to act type of thing. And then my senior year, I didn't have this – had half the season that I had my junior year. So my philosophy that I took for taking that scholarship helped me. And that's actually what happened. So I'm glad that I did that and get it pulled. Uh, because if I'd have had that same, if I'd have had the season that I had my senior year and I didn't commit, maybe they pulled that scholarship. So I locked in real fast right after my junior year and it paid off. For me. Well, no, that's, that's good to hear. And so um, you transitioned down from Florida uh, yeah. to Northeast Ohio. Northeast Ohio. Uh, to the, to the University of Akron. So talk about what that transition was like 
uh, from an athletic standpoint, an academic standpoint, and just an environment standpoint. Yeah. So let's talk. Let's let's talk about academically first. So I was a guy who barely made it, man. I made it by the skin of my teeth, as far as you know, meeting the clearinghouse and things like that. So I'm not ashamed of guy. I took the ACT five times. So I got two fifteen, two sixteen. 17. Matter of fact, I took it six times. I got a 17, then I finally got an 18. And at that point, I'm like, hey, I took it six times. Now I got to go to night school to meet my GPA. This is a sliding scale that you have to meet when it comes to your GPA and your test scores. Um, and at that time as well, I think I was the third African American to get a scholarship from that school. Um, the two before me got a scholarship, one with the Temple. Um, DeMar Anderson um, passed away now, rest his soul. Um, he ended up coming home. And we had some more people go to Juco that didn't make it. So I had that. I was looked at like, he's not going to make it. You know what I mean? Um, and for me, you know, at that time, I didn't, I haven't built any study habits or anything like that. But all I knew was, I mean, I'm not coming home. Like, there's no way. There's no way I can't not make it. And if I don't make it, I'm not coming back. You know, um, as far as the environment, I was a guy, I couldn't wait to leave Florida. You know, a lot of people retire and come to Florida, but that's all I knew. Never seen snow. Never been to Ohio. I mean, on my on my visit, I was up there in the hoodie. It was five degrees. Like they had to go get me a jacket, you know, because I didn't I didn't have a jacket. So, and one thing about Akron is, you know, looking at it now, I mean, Akron was good to me. Good to me. Um, I had my experiences, you know, with, with the game of football. But um, the city of Akron, I was there for seven years. Lived there. It's kind of like a second home to me now. Even when I go back now, I go and still get the honey gold. They want to go to Hadini's, get the steak and cheese, gyro, yeah. uh, stuff like that. So it was a good experience for me. It was way different uh, coming from Florida. Uh, even just living on the street, oh, where are you from? I can say one thing. I say, yes, ma'am, no, man. Oh, where are you from? You know, type of thing. So, but it was a good experience for me. I'm glad that I that I, that I went to Akron. I want to change um, nowhere. I want I want to go anywhere else. Yeah. So you talk about you had some different experiences with football. So actually, at the end of your first uh, season as, as a true freshman, uh, J.D. Brookhart and his staff, uh, they get low and get let go and get fired. Right. Um, and then a new coaching staff comes in. Um, talk about what that transition was like, what's going through your mind, and, and where are you at at this moment with a new coaching staff coming in the door? Anybody who plays the game, I mean, anybody who plays sports, somebody who's going to send a lot of your football. If you play sports and you're playing at the D1 level, you're pretty good. I don't care if it's – Akron, Bowling Green, Ohio State. If you're able to make a D1 and you got a full ride to do what you do, what you've been doing your whole life, I think you're pretty good. Now, one thing you got to think about is those kids who are 18, 19 that get to those schools have been doing that for years. They've been probably doing that for – I was doing it for 12 years before I got to Akron, 12 years straight. Didn't miss a season playing football. So what that does to you when you're in the paper, right, when you're in the Ultimate 24 – when the Jacksonville Jaguars send you a letter and say, hey, we want to honor you at the Ultimate 24 at halftime during the Buffalo Bills game, and they give you a jacket, it's like, what can stop you, right? I'm the man. Like, I'm going to Akron. I'm going to go up there and kill. I'm from Florida. Football's bred here. I don't know what they do up there in Akron, Ohio. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to kill them guys. They, all they want to do is get big. I'm going to run past those guys. So when I got up there, that was kind of my mindset because I was always the man. I was always good. I was always deep. He's, he's a great football player. And I think when I first got there, that's how that's how I went. That's how I went. J.D. Brookhart recruited me. Even though I read shirt, I had a great upside. Um, that would travel the games, even though I even though I didn't play. Um, I showed a little bit of what I can do. And I think I had a bright future with J.D. Brookhart. Um, and then they ended up getting let go. And when they got let go is when – that's when life really hit me right there. That's when life really hit me. And uh, when I found out – College football was a business. It was a business. I had to put my big boy boots on at that point. So your red shirt freshman year, your red shirt sophomore year, you don't get a lot of playing time. Right. What does that do to you mentally? Well, I tell you what, I think the first spring, so I get up there, fall 2009, they get let go. Um, Rob Inello comes in spring 19. Uh, I think that spring was on me. Uh, I didn't prepare like I needed to. Didn't go over my playbook, just try to go off athletic ability. And I didn't know because I was young. I was young. And uh, I think what that did is it put me in a hole, put me in a hole. And um, I was able to, you know, sit myself down, look in the mirror like, man, you know what? You can't go home this summer. You got work to do. So I didn't go home the whole summer. Stayed there, caught tennis ball, caught jugs, 
try to get my confidence back, and I ended up, you know, not playing. And you know what that does to you when you when when you've been playing for so long, and you know you got people back home that's kind of dependent on you. They look, they watching you. You know, you might get a text, "Hey, I didn't see you out there at the game." You know, because uh, I'm not playing. You know, and that stings. That stings because you never experienced that before. Um, but what it did for me is, you know, it, it made me grind a little bit harder. I, I would be lying if I said I didn't shed a couple of tears um, in my room when that alarm clock went off just because it's hard. Like a lot of people say, I want to play football, but I tell you now, if you don't love the game of football, you're not going to make it in the big game. If you don't have something that's going to drive you, you're not going to make it because it's a lot that goes into it physically and mentally. You got school, you got this, you got that. You, got, you might have a coach that doesn't, that doesn't like it. Now, if you're one of those guys that's, you know, you on the magnets, you know, you on the you on the bus, you on you on you on the poster boards. It might be a little bit easier. It might be a little bit easier for you, but it's still hard. It's still hard, and it's still politics, and it's, and it's still business. But you know, I think that made me stronger. I mean, I think that's a tough thing that I went through those two years. Um, but it made me stronger. And I'm glad I stuck in there. Yeah, I mean, me being a former athlete, I think you hit it right on the head. It's a business, you yeah. know, and you find out real quick, especially when there's a coaching change. So you're one of the few individuals that actually had another coaching change. So after those two years with Coach Rob Balmelo and his staff, they get let go. And then in the spring, Terry Bowden and his staff come in. So here you are. You've been at the University of Akron for three years, getting ready to go on four years. Uh, you played two years and you redshirted a year. And you're already on your third staff. Where are you at at this point mentally and with football as a whole? Yeah, so I think that red shirt uh, freshman year and sophomore year is when I – I think I would say my end of my red shirt freshman year. No, I would say the start of my red shirt sophomore year. When I see the depth chart, it was like, yeah, I'm going to have to think of something else. Uh, mm -hmm. For anybody who sees this this interview, Chuck Lewis was my advisor when I was there at the university. I remember going to his office like, I don't know what to do. I know I can't quit. I'll tell you right now, football, I'm going to finish it out, but I'm not going to play. You know, I'm not going to the league or anything like that. And uh, he, he brought up getting a master's. They didn't know what a master's was. So when Terry Bowden came in, you know, I, I wouldn't say I was a, I was a little happy, but I was more of, it might be the same thing, but it's cool, but I got a plan, you know. So I had five years to play, but I say if it gets master's at one year, then I'm just going to go get be a GA. I already had it set up. And Jorgensen, who was, who was running our, our, our academic department uh, with, with Chuck, uh, ended up giving me uh, the blessing to come in there with, with the, the help of Chuck. So I had a plan going into it, um, and then it ended up – Coach Down ended up being the best part. I mean, a blessing to me, you know, football-wise. Uh, you know, he's a Florida guy, so a Florida guy, down south guy. And uh, I ended up starting my last two years, which is going from the last bus to barely making it on the bus to – now I'm on the post. Right now, I get to take my pads off during the scrimmage. I'm just going one series, um, so that that was a blessing. But to me, it was just icing on the cake, you know, because I already had a plan. And honestly, I'm glad that I ran into Rob Ionello because if I didn't, maybe I don't. Maybe I'm not thinking the same way. Maybe I'm still thinking about. Maybe I do play for four years and I go in the record book that. Maybe I do try to go to the NFL, but maybe I don't have a master's right. Now. Maybe I'm not at Maryland right. Now, right. So I think that was the best. It couldn't happen any better. Yeah, I think going through that adversity allows you to have an opportunity to come up with a plan, a plan B. Right. You know, mm -hmm. Most of us that, that come from uh, similar environments as yourself, being a man, being great athletes, you yeah. know, and going to college and think you're going to set the world on fire and it doesn't go that way because of a coaching change, right. um, it sets you back a little bit because you're saying, what else is next for me? This is all I know. But it gave you an opportunity to come up with another plan. But things turned around for you. So right. – uh, in your junior year, uh, you perform at a pretty good level. Uh, I think you were second on the team in catches. You had 48 catches that year, 400 receiving yards, four touchdowns, was one of our go-to guys that year. What turned around for you mentally, and then what preparation did you put in that offseason to play at that level? Yeah, so for me, uh, I was always a hard worker. You know, at that point, it came to a point where I knew I wasn't going to play, but it was like, you know what, I know I'm not going to play, but I'm going to beat the starter in these one tens. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make it where people are gonna say, "Man, y'all are straight just doing the guy wrong." So, so that was kind of my mindset going into it. And what a lot of people don't know, when I said I started, yeah, I did start, but you gotta think about it. 
even though I was doing good in practice, scrimmages, I never played in a game before. So I went three years without playing in a game like a starter. I was on special mm. teams, but we played UCF. I never forget it. I think it was 2012, 2012. Um, I go out there, and, and in my opinion, I didn't have a good game. I uh, was nervous. Uh, even though I knew I had good ability, but I just never been out there between the lines. It's different in practice. When you're out there and the bullets are flying, it's different. So, so the, the game was moving real, really, really fast for me. And um, ended up getting my spot took that first week. So the next the next week we come back and I'm the second string. Second string. And uh, at that point, too, I, I started practicing a little bit harder. I think I got a little bit lazy. I was um, kind of stuck in my ways. You know, I, I felt like I was proven, but I really wasn't. So the man upstairs made me go through one more thing. I had to bounce back from that, you know, which I did. And, um, you know, just trying to trying to finish it out that, you know, that that season, I ended up having a good season. That's good, man. Um, so actually, uh, in spring of 2013, uh, you graduate early with one season left with your degree in sport management. How did it feel to accomplish that of getting your bachelor's degree? Well, you know what? When I got that bachelor's degree. I got it in the mail, man. It felt good, you know, it, it yeah. felt good, I made it. But I knew I wasn't done, you know, I knew I wasn't done. I still had a season left. I was, I was already prepared to get my, to get my master's. Um, so for me, I think my master's was the biggest achievement. I mean, even right now, I wouldn't be at Maryland right now without him. I didn't know the importance of it. I just thought, hey, this is what I need to get the next check. This is what I need to do for another year and a half so I don't go home. But what I was doing was preparing myself for greatness. And right. I didn't know that at the, uni- at the University of Akron. So, yeah, that those, getting those degrees was a big, big achievement. It definitely was a big achievement. So you go into your last year, uh, ready to rock and roll, uh, coming back, one of the better receivers, one of the better players on the team. And your senior season is pretty much plagued with injuries. Yeah. Where were you at mentally going through that season, going through injuries, and how were you feeling just about football as a whole you finally overcame, whether it was the coaching changes or all the obstacles that were in your way, you get to your senior year because you played the year before and you knocked it out the park and you played well. You get to your senior year, you're in the best shape of your life, and then the whole season is plagued with injuries. What does that do to you mentally and where are you just at with football at that point? Yeah, I think for me, um, so I played the first two games. Played, I think it was UCF, James Madison in Michigan. Played those first three games. Came back after that and uh, sprained my hamstring. So I missed two games. Um, at that point, I was like, oh, okay, I'm still still all right. Now, mind you, I still got a plan, though, because I wasn't thinking about the NFL. Unless I just had a spectacular three archer season, you know, I, I got to take my chances. But nine times out of ten, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get my matches. I knew that. Yeah. Um, and then when I came back and pulled my hamstring again with, with, with six games left, you know, it hurt me, man. I remember it hurt me. I remember, I remember the route I was running. I was running a dig against uh, JT Turn. JT, yeah, I was running running a dig against him, and um, our feet got caught up. And I should have just fell down, but tried to stretch out and keep up, and ended up pulling it again. But after about two days, you know, I, I sat down and I realized, man, what else do I need? You know, God bless me from the bottom, all the way to feel like to know what it feels like to be at the top. Okay, maybe I can't finish the season. But I'm good with it. I'm good with it. Um, so I, I just, I just looked at it like, um, man, football took you far as it can go. You know, it took you far as you can go, and it took you farther than a lot of people. You know, in this world, I remember some of my strength coaches. You like, need to fight to get out there, and I was. I was doing treatment. I was trying to get out there. But at that point, you talk about I missed five games now. So you got, you know, guys behind me that are in. And I'm not going to come back and just take guys' spot at that point. Um, you know, so. So that, that's why I kind of looked at it like, man, football, football is done for me. And I, and I was okay with it. I was good with it. Yeah. Uh, so you get an opportunity to work as a graduate assistant in academic services. What was that transition like going from being a student athlete in the workforce, working in the same department you were an athlete at? Yeah, so I tell you the biggest thing. The biggest thing is I had a lot of time on my hands. I mean, yeah. playing football, I mean, you get up at you, – you get you get the treatment at six, seven – I'm not getting home till seven, eight. You know, well now, okay, I got, I'm in grad school. I got nine hours. One of the classes is online. So I got one class this day. I got to, then I got to check in for, for my GA ship for five hours. I'm home at three o'clock, right? So at that point, I had too much time on my hands. So I had went and got a, a part-time job. 
working at the hospital. Uh, but the, the transition, it, it was it was it was different for me. Um, just from playing with guys to now checking the grades and hey, I need you to turn this in for me. I need you to be here at this time. You know, with some of the guys that I played with, and I think the foundation that I had. Um, I, I would I would have called myself a leader on the team. I wasn't a vocal guy, but I was a guy that tried to do what I was supposed to do. And I think guys respected me for it. I think that helped me when I went in transition uh, to grad school. The first semester, I didn't work with football because we wanted to, you know, kind of give it a little bit of space. But the next year, I worked with the same guys that I that I ended up playing with. Um, so that transition was good for me. First time putting on slack. Uh, first time tucking my shirt in. You know, first time wearing a tie. And um, you know, I, still had, I had to stop buying Air Maxes and Jordan. I had to go start buying. <laughs> I had to go start buying Dockers and stuff, man. So, but that was that's good. That was good for me. Yeah. So, in uh, spring of 2015, um, you graduate with your master's degree in sport administration, but then you also get a full time internship opportunity at Florida State. How did that all come about? I tell you what. So, a uh, guy Merce Poindexter, my uh, freshman year. He was my DA, so I would come to him and turn my grades in and things like that. And, you know, being in the field now, I tell a lot of guys, look, listen, like, you got a clean foundation when you get to, when you get to a school. Right? You're around a lot of professionals, coaches, trainers, academic people, marketing people, that when you graduate, there's no telling where they're going to be, right? And it's only going to take one time for them to say your name, to give you a reference, or potentially hand you a job. Um, so Merce Poindexter, I think he was my DA for two years, and he ended up going – uh, to Georgia Tech and then Florida State. And I remember you came up to me like, hey, you know, it's an internship at, at Florida State for academics. And I kind of looked at it like, oh, man, Florida, I can go back to Florida. I can go back to Florida. You know, I, I really missed Florida at that point. So I ended up doing an um, interview, a Skype interview, kind of like what we're on now, interview for the job. I ended up getting the job, which is, which is a blessing for me. So I was going on, you know, to the next step. And just like I talked about the Masters, I really didn't know what I was getting into down there. I didn't know that was going to turn into a full-time job. I didn't know that it would skyrocket me into the field and, and looking at myself now being in the field for four years and on, on the uprise, you know, that was a blessing as well. So if you're watching this, man, you're a youngster out there, uh, you know, take advantage of the people out around you. There's no, you don't know who you're going to encounter that can, that can be a blessing for you. So treat everybody the same. Treat everybody with respect. Be supposed to do, be on time, and it's going to pay off for you in the end. Yeah, I think one of the things that's been very important for you during your path and your journey is really just networking, you know, networking, being consistent in who you are, being on time and just being about the right things and being real too, authentic. Right. I mm -hmm. think that's important. Uh, so you transitioned down to Florida State, but you worked at Akron, going from a small school to a power five school such as Florida State. They had the likes of Peter Ward, Deion right. Sanders, all these big time yeah. uh, athletes uh, that played there. You know, what was that transition like going from a smaller school to a power five school? Well, you got to think about this. I grew up three hours from Florida State, so I knew the background. I knew, I knew their culture as far as athletics. They just came off a national championship in 2013. So about two years later, I'm down there. So coming from a small school to a big school, it was it, it was it was a different environment than, than I've ever been in. Um, I think Akron was more of a commuter school. It was right in the city. Didn't really have a campus feel to it. You know, Florida State, is, that's all Tallahassee has in Florida State. Um, so going down there and um, and going and getting them academics and learning from them, um, learning how the culture and things are, I, I thought it was, it was I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. I got a lot of experience down there. Uh, met my fiance down there, soon to be wife. Uh, so you can't complain, you know, about that. So I wouldn't change that for the world either. Yeah, so you complete your uh, internship at Florida State, but then you accept a new job at Georgia Southern University. How did that all come about for you? Yep, so um, how, how the internship kind of goes. So I think we came in in May. I think we started May, which like after Labor Day, at Memorial Day, one of those days. And then the next year, the next class will come in at that same time. So second semester around January, you start applying for jobs. You know, I was applying for jobs, interviewed at Clemson. Uh, so Ashton Henderson, who was a guy who came from Clemson, um, that's a pretty good, pretty good uh, associate of mine. You know, I could pick up the phone and call him now. He's, you know, big name in the field. Uh, so shout out to Ashton. You know, he ended up uh, connecting me with Reggie Simpson. Reggie Simpson, he was down there doing the Southern. Reggie and Ashton actually uh, switched spots at Clemson. So when Reggie left Clemson uh, as a football advisor, Ashton kind of uh, went in his spot. 
Um, so I interviewed for that job. Um, at this, at that point, I was about two weeks away from, you know, it was about time for me to leave. You know, intern, other interns are coming in. Um, so I ended up getting that job and, and started from there, and that was a good experience for me too. We'll pause right there. So you were the coordinator of academic support services for men's basketball. What was that experience like for you? Um, I think for me, uh, I think I started getting my first real academic experience at Florida State, you know. And, you know, no matter how much training or, or things, until you really get in, the same thing I talk about football, you can practice. Until you're out there in the line, you know, it's different. So going to basketball, um, even though I wasn't blessed to go right to a power five, I was blessed to work with an average sport off the jump. So I ended up working on basketball with about 14 or 15 guys. And one thing I can say about them, I say they were disciplined. Uh, I think the thing that I had to learn, uh, obviously with your advisor piece being in this school, any school you go to, the advisor is going to be a little bit different. Um, but it was a great experience for me. You know, I felt a little heat, uh, I worked, which I think was good for me. Um, you know, I'm a guy that when you back me in the corner, uh, I got I got to find a way to get out of there. You know, I got to fight or fight with me and I'm going to fight. You know, I got I got to make sure, you know, that I get things done. And I, I actually worked with track there as well. Uh, first time working with female sports. And that was different. Mm -hmm. That was different for me as well. Didn't, didn't grow up with any sisters, right? So all I grew up by myself, but I got brothers. I got two older brothers. So that was an experience for me as well. So, but uh, working from working for Reggie, you know, you really don't have a lot of uh, experience when you have a good supervisor. And I think, you know, I was blessed to have a good supervisor coming out of the gate. Uh, I wasn't too far from home. I still was in Georgia. Still was in Georgia. wasn't too far from my dad. Um, and basketball, I got to travel. Got to travel. We ended up, you know, having one of the highest GPAs um, that spring semester before I came to Maryland. So I can't complain about that either. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about Reggie Simpkins. Um, what was his leadership style? I think Reggie's leadership style was more of non micromanage. He's not going to micromanage you. Um, obviously, he's a relationship guy, people person guy. Uh, I think with him, you know, he, he values the relationship. It's kind of kind of like like me as well. Uh, but I think also when he's got your back as well, you know, as, as a as an employee, you want to make sure your supervisor is getting down and dirty with you, right? I don't think he would ask you to do anything that he wouldn't do. Uh, I would go in his office and see him working on a, working on a, on a grade report, you know, things of that nature. You know, even when I got a couple calls for jobs, he never steered me in the right direction, told me if you want to look at it, look at it, make sure you ask these questions, you know, so he never held me back. Uh, obviously a mentor to me. Um, some obviously he's in a place that somewhere I want I want to get to one day a senior associate uh, athletic director. So I would say that's the main part of his leadership style. So after working at Georgia Southern for a year, uh, you decided to accept the job at the University of Maryland. So what was that transition like going from Statesboro, Georgia to the DMV? Yeah, that's totally different, man. I mean, being in uh, in Georgia, I mean, I live right next to a cotton field. I mean, it was in the middle of nowhere. I mean, one of those towns, you come out your door at 9 o'clock at night, you can't see anything. No street lights. I mean, it's just pitch black. Uh, I think coming to the DMV, I think it was a no-brainer for me. Obviously, uh, my fiance had a, uh, not my fiance, my fiance now, not at the time, my girlfriend at the time. Um, but we both came up here together, which is, which is a blessing. Um, thanks, thanks to you and, and putting that job out there and, and giving us a shot at getting it. We didn't know we, we were going to get it, but, you know, God bless us actually to get it. Uh, the biggest thing about coming to the DMV is, you know, I was never a city guy. I never grew up in the city. I always grew up, you know, Jacksonville, is, it's city, but it's not city, like where it's traffic and you got all these people in one place. You know, I grew up saying, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. I grew up holding doors. I ended up, you know, I grew up like that. So coming up here was a little bit different, uh, more gritty, more gritty, um, more of a, hey, man, this is your lane, this is my lane. And we go like that, you know, it kind of tricks you at first when you get up here, you see a lot of African American, a lot of successful African American. Uh, but at the same time, some of them might might not be friendly though, you know. So that was a big experience for me. And then just coming coming to the University of Maryland, which where it's another power five school. Um, they do things a little bit different, more this is this is the this is the biggest high academic achievement school that I've been to. I've been to Florida State Athens. So Maryland is known for their academics, they're known they're not really known for sports other than basketball. You know, basketball is pretty good, but academics really rules, you know, this school, which I had to get used to that as well, being an athlete, being in, in the athletic you know, in that field. So definitely a transition, but I'm glad I made it. 
So you're an academic counselor working in academic support in the athletic department at Maryland. Talk about your current role. Uh, as far as like what I do? Yep. Yeah, so currently currently what I do, I have an academic counselor. Uh, I work with a specific uh, position group. So I work with the old offensive line, work with the linebackers, and I work with the DB. So we're talking around about 40, 45 people that I work with. And the biggest thing that we do is we want to make sure guys are on track to graduation. Right? We want to make sure uh, – that, that we're, we're doing recruitment games when, when uh, potential student athletes are coming that are interested in Maryland, giving them the background, selling the school, selling the football program, selling what we do, and helping the coaches out, you know, with that coming in. And the biggest thing about what we do is we want to be mentors as well. You know, I remember when I came in as a student athlete, didn't know anybody, coming from Florida all the way to Akron, Ohio, uh, not knowing anybody, you're looking for a mentor, you're looking for somebody that can, you know, put, take you under the wing, you know, and show you the right way you know, to kind of do things. So being in this field is different, man. I mean, you deal with a lot of pressure. You deal with a lot of, you know, it might be on you if this kid don't make it. I know it's not fair, but that's kind of how they look at it, how they look at it. Uh, but at the same time, we got perks as well. I mean, we never sat in the stands for a game, right? I'm on the sideline. I'm eating steaks. I'm eating oxtails. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm eating perks. Yeah, tons of ranch. Like, you know, so – Sometimes we gotta miss those meals because it's like we 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 don't we don't run those one tens really like that. Yeah. You know, so I wouldn't change it for the world, man. Sometimes it's like any job gets you down every now and then. Um, even now, you know, with the certain rules, the reason our field is really came coming to what it is now is because, you know, back in the day when Dion Sanders, Barry Sanders, all those guys, like none of them really graduated, right? There was no rules set in place where you had to graduate. People just went the school played football and left now, which I think is a good thing that NCAA did that is now you got to have a certain GPA after your first year, a certain amount of credit stack, a certain GPA after your second year, third year. And what that does is put you on track to graduation. And I think what a lot of schools did was, well, man, if, that's, if they got to meet that, then we need to hire staff to help them do that you know, or help them get to that or, or let them know this is the class you got to take to get to that. And that's kind of how I feel um, came into place. But I didn't know I would be an academic counselor. I knew I didn't want to be a coach. So for me, I always say that the field chose me. Uh, being a guy that was at risk in academics, now he's working in academics, making sure getting their, everybody's getting their grades right. I think that's just the man that says to put me where he wanted. Yeah, I mean, obviously a be- blessing from God put you in the right position, uh, but I think it also is just a testament to your hard work and your dedication and just seeking out the help too. I think a lot of young people nowadays sometimes don't always seek the help or seek the right help too. So I think just taking full advantage of your opportunity and uh, when you got an opportunity, you made the best of it, man. So um, you're in a position right now to make change, to make impact in a lot of people's la- life. Right, and right. your journey makes you the perfect guy for it. You were an athlete. Yep. You played at the Division One level. Like you talked about before, you ran 110s. Right. You know, you got your degree, uh, your undergraduate degree. You got your master's degree. So you've achieved things at a high level and as a player and as an academics mm-hmm. as far as being a student. So you would only be right to be in the position that you're in because you can really give those guys real information. Right. And really talk to them about the do's and the don'ts and how to overcome some of the adversity that you went through. Right. Um, so we at the last part of the show. It's called top five. So I got some five. categories and okay. you give me your top five in those categories. So number one, I know you're a hip hop guy. Uh, yeah. I know you like rap. Give me yeah. your top five rappers of all time. And it could be your favorite. It don't got to be your top, like the top five, but your favorite five. Okay. I don't, I don't want to put them one, two, three. I'm just going to put them top five, right? Yeah. So I got to go with T.I. Got to go with T.I., man. Young Jeezy, Tupac. <laughs> um, I got to I gotta, I gotta go with – I got to throw Gucci in there, man, because he got me through in high school. I got to throw <laughs> Gucci. Man. We got four. We got Gucci, man. We got, uh, we got T.I. We got Tupac. Yeah. We got Jeezy. Yeah. All right, and then one thing I gotta say too, man, I gotta put Plies in there. I feel <laughs> Florida, Plies yeah. been doing it a long time. Though he had a lot of haters, mm. he came out and he came out at '09. He's still doing his thing, so I gotta represent him. Man. Now, all those guys have done big things in in the hip hop industry, so that's a good five. So my right. next one is is give me your top five NBA players of all time. Man, I tell you what, man, I gotta go with Jordan. I gotta go with Kobe, man. R.P. Kobe Bryant. You know, that was a big loss for us. Uh, shook the whole world up. And so uh, he was a guy, in my opinion, who had Jordan in him. Just a, just a killer out there, you know. A lot of people didn't have that in him. So 
Kobe, Jordan, um, LeBron. Um, obviously, you got to throw Magic. And I know he's before my time, man, but Magic Magic, Magic was a beast, man. He, he, he did his thing. And, and, for, and for that last one, man, for me, um, with this guy just playing dual sports and, and uh, playing football and being on the smaller side, I always represent for the smaller guys. I got to go with Allen Iverson, man. I like Allen Iverson. Um, used to wear his jersey back then, man. Big 56 jersey, man. With his head. <laughs> I had to tuck it in, you know, in ninth grade. So I, those are my top five. Really a football guy, not really a basketball guy. Uh, I really kept it during the playoffs and things like that, but I was, that's my top five. Yeah, I mean, especially speaking about AI, man, I mean, he changed the culture of the NBA, you know, and he made it cool. He brought the, the urban culture. Um, he brought the hood, uh, for lack of a better word, in the hip-hop industry all to the NBA, and he yep. dominated for years there. Yep. Um, yep. So my next question is, is what are the top five places you ever visited or vacation? Top five places you ever visited. Okay, I would say uh I would say Miami. I've been to Miami. Uh, I was younger. I was younger, so I wasn't I think I was around like 15, 16, you know, at that age, you can't really do you know, do what you want. But that's one of the big places that I that I visited that I remember being, you know, just a beautiful place. Uh when I was out in California, Palm Springs was about mm-hmm, about two hours away, Palm Springs. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was able to visit there in a nice place in California, uh, which was the real, you know, the real California. Uh, right. Which was just really, 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 really good. Uh, let me see the next place I would say. I've been to San Francisco. San Francisco was nice. Went to the Golden Gate Bridge. Wow. I was able to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. You know, obviously that's a big landmark uh, where people, you know, people have never been to, uh, things like that. So, uh, I got I got to put in Orlando. You know, I, I'm a guy. I've never been out the country. I've never been out of the country before. I'm, I'm working on it now. Me and my fiance, we want to travel. Yeah. So uh, so all my stuff is in the United States. So Orlando was was a good spot for me. Just growing up, you know, growing up, going to the amusement park, going to Wet and Wild, and going to the water parks. And Orlando. When I heard Orlando, if you would have said Orlando when I was 15 or younger, man, I'd probably jump out my seat. You know. So uh, that was that was a big spot. You know, for me too. And then New York, obviously New York, um, being in New York, man, just being around all those people, and it's just different, man. Horns is blowing every now, you know, every two, three seconds. Uh, being out of your element, shoulder to shoulder, kind of making you uncomfortable a little bit. But uh, I got to throw that one in there. That was that five? Yeah, that's five. That's five. So the last question of the top five segment is, give me your top five movies of all time. Or your favorite. Your favorite. And I gotta go paid in full. Paid, paid in full. full. Yeah, one of my uh, favorites. Yeah, I gotta go with that one. I gotta go with Training Day. I gotta go with Training Day with, with Denzel. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I gotta go with him. And I gotta go remember the Titans, man. I, I'm a Denzel guy, so I gotta go remember the Titans being a football guy. You know, obviously you're dealing with a lot of that social justice and stuff right now that they were dealing with when that movie came out 15 years ago, you know. Um, another movie that I say I would like, John Q. John Q was a good movie for me uh, with Denzel. You know, when his son was um, had that heart condition, and he had nothing else to do. He, he said, "I gotta, I'm gonna die for my son." So yeah, right. that was that was a good one for me. And uh, I would say my last one, my last movie um, that I say I would like. It's an older movie, but it's 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 it's, it's a nice movie. Shotter, I like Shotter. Okay. Yeah, okay. Of, you know, those guys coming from Jamaica. Yeah. Uh, and, and I know it's top five. I got, but, but Scar, I got to throw Scarface in there, too. Man. So <laughs> yeah. I throw Scarface in there. You know, guys taking over, man. You know, getting their money. Yeah. You know, buying the fast car, living the fast yeah. life. You yeah. know, when you're young, you know, that's that's kind of how you, how you want to be. So yeah. I, roughly, I knew that was six, but yeah. those are the movies, man, that I, that I you know, strongly live by. You know, all those movies uh, are classics for sure. Well, we at the end of the show... Uh, number one, a big part of this show is us also giving you an opportunity to tell your story. Right. Even more importantly, giving you a crown while you're alive. You know, you've done some amazing things. I think one of the things about your journey uh, that has been good for your story is perseverance. You yeah. know, you've been able to persevere through a lot of obstacles that came your way mm-hmm. when there was probably about three or four times during your times in college or whether it was high school where you could have quit, whether it was transitioning from California and then back to Florida within like a year and a half whether you're going through three different coaching staffs, which is probably a record at the division one level. Not too many guys have done that. Right, 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 right. With you, you know, and you could have thrown in the towel then 
uh, and just transitioning in the field and trying to find a job. You know, you're going to hear a lot more no's before you hear yeses. And you're young in the field. You haven't even hit your prime yet. So I want to salute you. We want to give you your crown while you're alive, man, because you're doing some amazing things. You impacted a lot of people's lives. And your story is huge because a lot of people can benefit from it and be impacted from it because they can look at it and see all the things that you went through and look at it as a guide and a plan and a path. For them. Right, right. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so I appreciate you coming on, man. Go ahead, man. Hey, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate you giving me the crown, man, while I'm still alive, man. <laughs> you know, don't put it on my tombstone, man. I still yeah. got a lot of work to do. One thing I want to tell people out there, though, is, hey, I still got a lot of work to do, man. That's just the, that's just the start of it. Uh, Always keep grinding, man. Never, never get to a point where you stagnant, right? And if you get to that point, man, try to find something to motivate you, motivate you a little bit more. So now, now I'm, I'm trying to get motivated a different way. I used to get motivated by going to run routes. I used to get motivated by, you know, going to lift weights. Now I'm not an athlete anymore. So now I'm doing it now by making sure my credit is right, right? Making sure my my, my fiance is better. Right. Making sure her, her lease is up in her car in February. And I got to start motivating myself now to make sure I, I can help her with the down payment on her buying a car so you, know, you just kind of you, you transition in a, in a different way when you get when you get into the real world man but i salute you back and i appreciate appreciate you having me on the show man well, well thanks for coming on the show well thank you for tuning into your journey be safe and god bless god bless too man <laughs>